Thank you guys very much for coming to our event today. My name is Jeff Greenberg. I'm a programming director here at the Chicago FedStock. It's my pleasure to introduce to you John Lott and uh, Professor Henderson. So Dr. John Lott is currently the president of the National Crime Prevention Research Center. Um, he graduated from UCLA with a BA, a master's, and a PhD, after which he joined the ranks of academia at such distinguished institutions as Rice University, best school, the University of Chicago, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and Yale Law School, among many others. Dr. Locke has published hundreds of papers in many peer-reviewed journals and uh, newspapers such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Los Angeles Times. He has served in government as the Chief Economist for the United States Sentencing Commission and as a Senior Economic Advisor to the Department of Justice in the Trump Administration. Providing commentary will be Professor M. Todd Henderson, the Michael J. Martin Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. I teach here. That's all you need to know. <laughs> John? I was going to plug your book. John, I was going to plug my book. <laughs> not, not that you will buy it, but you can plug my book. Uh, Native Americans and the Supreme Court, out now. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Lott, the floor is yours. Okay, sure. Thanks. Well, it's nice to be back here. Are we waving? Oh, sorry. I was saying this good. Okay. <laughs> well, hi. hi. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, nice to be back here. It's been uh, it's been a while. So, um, uh, but I always enjoyed uh, uh, being here at Chicago Law School. It used to be, uh, I mean, I've been I don't know how many universities I've been at, uh, but uh, the seminars, the academic seminars at the University of Chicago, used to be the liveliest. Uh, and we used to have people like Richard Epstein and Dick Posner and Bill Landis and uh, Dan Fischel and Frank Easterbrook and others. One of the things that always distinguished the law school was uh, the faculty would read the papers before uh, the seminars were given. And so there were a number of times where you would be in the seminar and people would start asking questions before the speaker said anything. And, uh, and that pretty much was the way the rest of it would go. Uh, most other places, speaker drones on for about 45 minutes or so because nobody's read the paper. And, uh, and then they don't ask that great of questions because they're still trying to figure out the paper from the talk that's given there. So uh, anyway, it's quite a, quite a remarkable intellectual history uh, for the university here. And it was of the different universities that I had the pleasure to be at, this was, uh, this was pretty amazing. So anyway, uh, you know, we know uh, violent crime has soared in the United States over the last couple of years. Uh, and it's not really a mystery what's happened. You know, in Chicago, they cut the number of police officers in, tw in 2020 by 400 positions. 
plus they moved literally dozens of others from doing kind of normal patrol actions to protect the mayor Lightfoot and other important city council people. Uh, but you know, across the country, you've had New York City cut its police budget by a billion dollars a year, Los Angeles by 150 million, DC by 15 million, and so on. Um, and uh, of course, you have people like uh, Kim Fox, your DA here, uh, who refuses to prosecute many violent criminals. One of my favorite stories of hers was about a year and a half ago, you had two rival drug gangs fighting it out at about 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you may have heard about this, where uh, the whole fight was caught on high definition video, and you also had uh, police officers there present witnessing them shooting each other. Uh, one person was killed, people were sent to the hospital. Uh, uh, Fox's um, uh, office refused initially to prosecute them under the explanation that it was mutually agreed to combat. <laughs> <laughs> they later uh, decided not to prosecute them because uh, they just didn't have enough evidence, which Lori Lightfoot, a former prosecutor, even for her, given how left when she was, was too much given that it was caught on high definition video and you could see who was actually firing the shots and, uh, and other evidence there. Uh, and we've had other things like uh, large percentages of inmates being released from jails and prisons in many urban areas. You've had half of the inmates being released. There's some urban areas where you've had over two thirds of the inmates being released from uh, prisons over the last couple of years. You know, the thing is, if you're talking about somebody who's 65 or whatever, I could understand that, but as you know, the vast majority of criminals there are young males. You know, they're not the type of people that are particularly susceptible to COVID. And then of course we've had bail reform. Uh, for anybody who's in law and economics here, I'll just mention one thing, and that is uh, take something like the uh, Wisconsin murderer, mass murderer, who drove his SUV into the Christmas parade uh, a little bit over a year ago, killing six people and sending 61 people to the hospital. Uh, he previously had been arrested and was facing trial for attempted murder of the mother of his child. And he had three other felonies that he was facing. If you add up all the felonies that he was facing there, he was facing literally 30 years in prison. 38 years old, he's already essentially facing a life sentence. You know, I don't know if you look at the statistics for life expectancy in prison, but for somebody like that, there's like over a two thirds probability that they'll die before they get to the end of their term. And, uh, um, but he was released on $1,000 bail, which meant he had to put up a whole hundred dollars in order to get out. And, but the question is, what additional you know, in terms of law and economics, what was the marginal penalty that you can impose on him if he goes and kills a person? It's like zero. He's already facing life sentence. You give him a second life sentence, you know, in case he has a second life there, that you can make sure that he'll be punished for that, or the third life sentence, or the fourth, or the fifth. Essentially, you're in a situation where he gets free crimes because there's no additional penalty that you can impose on him. So there are lots of things here that one can talk about, about why violent crime has gone up, but kind of as an economist, it's pretty straightforward that if you make it so that there's no risk to committing crime, guess what? You're going to have more crime that's going to be committed. Now, obviously, people, when they talk about who gets hurt by crime, people focus on the direct victims of the crime, but there's a lot more than that that occurs. So, for example, one thing you have to understand is that crime, and I'm going to show you some data on this, is very localized in the United States, okay? People tend to commit crimes against people who are like themselves, okay? So if you just take it on the basis of race, over 90% of murders of blacks are committed by other blacks. Most murders by Hispanics are committed by Hispanics. Most murders by whites are committed by other whites. And people tend to commit those crimes in the neighborhoods that they live in. So you have crime that's very heavily localized. Uh, people like themselves, heavily minority areas. 
what happens to the businesses in those areas? They may close, okay? The ones that remain open, they're gonna have to charge higher prices. Who works in those businesses? Similar people, other minorities. Who shops in those businesses? It's gonna be similar people, the minorities, heavily black areas that are there. Um, and who owns houses in those areas? It's gonna be basically poor blacks whose housing values will go down as you have increases in crime. So um, uh, the, the people that are harmed from crime, okay, you know, you have a lot of people say that they care about the poor and they care about minorities, so we have this push these days to lower the penalties for minorities. But what you end up having uh, at the same time then is the very victims are overwhelmingly the same type of people that they claim that they care about. So I just want to show you some stuff. We just updated this. This is data for 2020. 1% uh, of the counties in the United States account for 42% of the murders. 2% of the counties in the United States, which make about 27% of the population, account for 56% of the murders. The 5% worst counties in the United States <coughs> account for 73% of the murders, okay? Uh, and, and if you look at what's called murder maps for these places, and the vast majority of these counties where you have the murders concentrated, about two thirds of the murders occur within 10 block areas of, uh, so it's very, not only is it concentrated in a few counties, but within those counties, the murders are very heavily concentrated in small areas. By contrast, 52% of the counties in the United States have zero murders, and another 16% have one murder. So you have almost 70% of the counties in the United States have either zero or one murder that's, that takes place. <clears throat> to show you, uh, so this is for Los Angeles. I, I did this by zip code. Uh, this is by housing value, and it's broken down so there's about equal percentages of houses across the uh, seven areas that are here. Uh, the homicide rate for the poor, lowest value homes is almost 20 uh, per 100,000. Uh, you know, you start getting into uh, you know, the top 40% uh, or so of the homes and you're down to homicide rates that are about uh, one-tenth of that. And there's another way you can look at it. You can just look at it by zip codes, the percentage of murders uh, in the top 10% worse is 41%. If you add it up for the top 30% uh, worse zip codes, you're talking about about 86%. And if you look at the safest ones, the 30% the safest have zero murders. And uh, the top, the 40% safest ones have 1% have of all the murders. So Los Angeles isn't as concentrated as it used to be. Uh, murders over the last couple of years have kind of spread out more. Uh, this would have been even more concentrated if, with the data from uh, 2016 or so, but it's still fairly concentrated. So I've done a lot of research on guns <coughs> over time, and um, uh, if my research convinces me of anything, there's basically two groups of people who benefit the most from owning guns. Uh, and it's going to be relevant for the rest of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. One, one group that benefits the most are the ones who are most likely victims of violent crime. Uh, I think police are extremely important in stopping crime. But the thing is, police virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occur. And the question is, what should people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves? And the safest course of action, for, particularly for people who are relatively weaker physically, whether it be women, the elderly, is to have a gun. But it's also most relevant for the people who are most likely victims of violent crime, and that overwhelmingly tends to be poor blacks uh, who live in high crime urban areas. So right now, uh, we have about 22 million, uh, a little bit of 22.5 million as of last year, concealed carry permit holders in the United States. And that's despite the fact that now we have 25 constitutional carry states where it's no longer required that you have to have a permit uh, to be able to go <coughs> and carry. And, uh, uh, but it's interesting, you know, this is really the only hard data that exists on permit holders. Uh, 
you know, they do surveys of gun owners in the United States. That's pretty useless. Uh, I'll just give you one simple example for that. Um, if you look at surveys that ask people whether they own a gun, uh, the percentage of married men who say that a gun is owned in the home is about 15 percentage points higher than the percentage of married women who say a gun is owned, owned in the home. <laughs> you know, there are all these surveys, like they'll go and ask men and women how many partners that they've had sex with and what have you, and guys are way up there and women are way down. You know, I don't know about this, but it could be, um, uh, you know, maybe guys like to brag about having a gun and they don't have it, or maybe they somehow haven't told their wives about it, but probably the most obvious explanation is simply that women may be more reluctant to tell a stranger that a gun's owned in the home than a man might be. But if you look over uh, the recent data, uh, the growth rate for concealed carry permits has been much faster for women uh, than for men, over 100% faster, and also for blacks uh, has been much faster uh, than for whites. So you've been seeing what I would regard as the people who benefit the most uh, have seen the biggest increases. Now I want to kind of get to the crux of, uh, of the talk here, and that is uh, just talking about how gun control regulations make it difficult for the very people who benefit the most from owning guns from being able to go and do so. Let me give you a comparison, since we're in Illinois right now. Just compare Illinois with neighboring Indiana. In Illinois, about 4% of the adult population has a concealed carry permit. In Indiana, it's over 22%. Why the difference? It's pretty simple. In Illinois, it costs about $450 to go through the process to go and get a concealed carry permit. I'm not talking about the FOID cards or anything else, but just the cost of the permit and the, and the training requirements that are there. It's in Indiana, the total cost up until about a year or so ago was about $12.95, now it's zero. Uh, and uh, you know, you make something more costly, people do less of it. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's, but it's not just affecting the number of people who go and get permits. It also affects the composition of who gets permits. If you have to pay $450 to go through the process to get a concealed carry permit, who do you think are the types of people? I mean, we're, just, we're not talking about the price of the gun or anything else. We're just talking about the permit that allows you to legally carry. Basically, what you're going to find is that the type of people who go and get permits are wealthy white males who live in the suburbs. Now, is it fine that they're getting it? Yeah, that's great. But they're not the ones who are most likely victims of violent crime. You're not going to see the same reduction in crime. If criminals, I would argue, what happens with concealed carry permits is you, just like with police, you have higher arrest rates, higher conviction rates, longer prison terms make it risky for criminals to go and commit crime. And as you make it riskier for criminals to go and commit crime, you're going to see less crime going to be committed. Well, the fact that victims might be able to go and defend themselves also makes it riskier for criminals to go and commit crime. But if it's the people who are caring are the ones that the criminals aren't going to be robbing to begin with, then it really doesn't make much difference. If you're going to want to reduce crime, you're going to have to make it so that the people who are actually the victims are the ones that are caring. But if you make it $450 to go and get a concealed carry permit, guess what? the people who are the most likely victims aren't going to be able to carry. So if you compare Indiana with Illinois, you see a lot more zip codes, which are heavily minority, very poor, having concealed handgun permits in Indiana than you have in Illinois. But it's not just that. It's kind of like they went down a whole list of things to make it impossible for poor blacks to be able to go and carry. So, for example, up until a few years ago, there were no training facilities allowed in Chicago, all right? It's against the law in Illinois to carry even a permanent concealed handgun on public transportation. So let's say you're a poor black who lives in Chicago, you're worried about the crime, and you want to go and be able to carry a concealed handgun to protect yourself and your family. Well, it's 16 hours of training here in Illinois to be able to go and get your permit. Uh, let's say you don't own a car. What are you going to have to do? There are no training facilities in, here in Chicago. You're going to have to go and borrow a car 
on either two or four days because 16 hours, the maximum training time is eight hours at a time, though most places break it down into four, four hour segments that you're gonna have. So you're gonna have to borrow a car for maybe four days to travel well outside the city to be able to go and get the training that's there. You know, it's kind of, as I say, it's kind of like they went through every checklist that they can, say how, you know, the cost, the inconvenience, having to go and travel way outside the city to be able to go and get the training. It's kind of like they went out of their way uh, to make it as difficult as possible for them to be able to get permits. I'll show you some data from Texas. One of the things that you've seen over time uh, in the right to carry states, generally not in Illinois, uh, has been uh, the rules have gradually become relaxed in terms of who is allowed to carry uh, and, and the rules on uh, getting a permit. So when Texas first uh, adopted its concealed carry law back in 1996. Uh, it cost $100, $140 to go and uh, pay for a permit. Uh, it took 10 hours of training to initially get a permit and then it took 10 hours to renew it. Uh, and there was like a long list of like 33 gun-free zones that were listed there. Over time those have been reduced and more recently uh, they moved to constitutional carry, which is kind of just a continuation of the trend, I would argue. But there's some interesting data here. So, for example, uh, back essentially in January 2014, uh, they uh, had the reduction in training requirements from 10 hours to 3 to 4 hours. Prior to that, the percentage of permit holders that were black was, was falling. After that, it kind of stopped falling and leveled off. And then in 20, uh, 2017, in the middle of the year, they, uh, they reduced the fee from $140 to $40. And what happened? You saw the share of permit holders that were black, not only had it stopped falling, but now was starting to rise. And the interesting thing is, not only uh, did you see uh, this rise in the share, but there's a huge increase in the percentage of permits that were out there. This is just breaking down by race. You can see here white males over time. Uh, uh, so let's see. Uh, uh, oh, black females. This is black females. The huge growth rate that we've seen and it's really taken off since 2013. And then you have black males here. So black males have grown at about twice the rate that uh, white males have. And for, for black females compared to white uh, females, it's like three times. <clears throat> and a lot, and that growth has really occurred since they reduced the training and the fee requirements that were there. And you can see uh, the number of permits prior to 2013, it was basically, you know, maybe you see, uh, you know, 20, 30,000 increase per year prior to that. It exploded after they reduced the training requirements and then the fees. And so not only is the share of blacks going up, and particularly the share of black females soaring there, but uh, you know the total, so they're really increasing uh, relative to other groups. So, um, you know, we just had the Bruin case this last year. I don't know how much of you followed that. But essentially, you had seven states that uh, required what they had May issue rules. So you had to go into some public official and provide a good reason for why you should be able to go and have a permit concealed handgun to go and protect yourself. And uh, these are heavily democratic states. You know, New York, California, New Jersey, Maryland, uh, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Hawaii. I know I'm missing somebody. But, um, uh, you know, you know, the irony is these heavily democratic states, they claim they care about blacks, they care, they claim they care about poor people, they claim they care about women. Well, I was able to go and get uh, a list of all the people that had concealed carry permit in Los Angeles County in 2013. So they had 341 concealed carry permit holders. Basically, the types of people who got permits were basically wealthy, politically connected white males and some Asian males 
who gave large amounts of uh, campaign donations to the sheriff. And, uh, um, but if you break it down, what you find is that uh, only about 7.6% of the permit holders were women, 5% were black, and 6% were Hispanic. You know, just by contrast, nationwide, where you don't have to go to a public official and justify why you have a good reason, about 29% of permit holders are women. Now, is it just that in Los Angeles County, women aren't stalked? that they're not threatened with violent crime compared to other uh, counties across the country. Maybe Los Angeles County is a very safe place for women compared to other places. Uh, but you can also look at for blacks. Uh, uh, nationwide, about 12% of permit holders are black, uh, which is pretty close to their share of the national population. Uh, in Los Angeles County, about 10.5% uh, of the population is black and yet they only have about 5% of the permit holders are black. And in Los Angeles County, 54% of the population is Hispanic, and yet they only have 6% of the permit holders. Is it just that blacks and Hispanics in Los Angeles County aren't threatened with crime? That, or is it just that the powers that be, when they're trying to determine whether or not somebody has a good reason to be able to go and protect themselves, they just don't think that they have particularly good reasons uh, compared to other people for why they should be given that chance to be able to go and protect themselves. So similar stuff that I have for uh, uh, New York City. I want to go through one other case here uh, just to give you some thoughts on this and just give you an example. And that's these universal background checks. And. Uh, uh, you know, you look at the, this is one thing they talk about, you know, 95% support for it. If you ever read the survey questions on universal background checks, the way the survey questions would read is, uh, do you support uh, background checks on uh, all private sales of guns uh, in order to stop criminals from being able to go and get the guns? 95% say yeah. Now, it turns out that the survey questions kind of simplify the laws. I mean, if you ever look at these laws, they're like 20 pages of tiny type, and uh, there's a lot more complications. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you have a woman friend uh, who calls you up on a Saturday evening. Her ex is threatening her, and she's scared. And she's somebody who you know knows how to use a gun. You have no problem with that. You know she's law-abiding. She's never committed a crime of anything. And she calls you up, and she says, can I borrow a gun for a few days until I can go to a store and be able to go and buy a gun? Well, if you live in a state like Illinois here, where uh, uh, you, know, you have these universal background checks, if you lend her your gun, you will be committing a felony where you can go to jail for five years. Okay, you're only allowed to lend, you guys know these terms, you're only allowed to lend her a gun if she is in imminent danger of death or serious injury, which means the guy is literally right there threatening her at that time. You can't say, well, he may come in a couple hours. That's not going to cut it. And you are required to take the gun back as soon as that imminent threat disappears. So you might as well just be there anyway. And why, so why even lend her the gun? Because you're going to be there anyway during the whole time that there's going to be the threat. If you're going to be able to give it to her right when there's an imminent threat and take it back right when it's over. So, you know, those are just some of the fine print that's there that most people don't understand when they say, sure, let's do these laws on the background check. Anyway, it has implications for the general discussion that we're talking about here, okay? You know, it's often also brought up to stop mass public shootings. There's not one mass public shooting this century that would have been stopped if such laws had been in effect nationally and had been perfectly enforced. Uh, so the frequent claim that is made is that there are 3.8 million dangerous or prohibited people that have been stopped from buying guns because of background checks. And that's simply false. What they should say is there have been 3.8 million initial denials. And then virtually all of those, something like 99% of those are mistakes. It's one thing to stop a felon from buying a gun. 
It's another thing to stop somebody simply because they have a roughly phonetically similar name and similar birthday to buying a gun. Now, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands for how many people have bought guns in here, <laughs> but uh, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But the, but the thing is, if you buy a gun, you fill out something called a 4473, where you put down your name, your address, your birthday, your race, your gender, your eye color, your social security number, and you think they're going to use all that information. But in fact, what they use is roughly phonetically similar names and similar birthdays. So if you're two people born in June, that's the same, okay, of a particular year. Or if uh, one person, uh, name is Smith with an I and another person's name is Smith with a Y and an E, those are considered to be the same uh, names that are there. And the, the problem is people tend to have names similar to others in their racial groups. Hispanics have names similar to other Hispanics. Blacks tend to have names similar to other blacks. 34% of black males in the United States have felony backgrounds. 18% of Hispanic males in the United States have felony backgrounds. It's 6% for whites, 3% for Asians. Now, why is that important? Because the mistakes, then, are overwhelmingly concentrated in black males and Hispanic males, because they're more likely to have a roughly phonetically similar name and similar birthday to a, a, a law-abiding good person is more likely to be stopped from buying a gun simply because they have a roughly phonetically similar name and birthday to somebody who is actually prohibited. He's showing me the time. Oh, no. Okay, so, I look, I can talk for hours, so I've tried, but I don't have too many more slides, so you don't have to worry too much. <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, uh, so you have this false positive problem. It's an easy fix for this. All you have to do is make the federal government have to meet the same standards for doing background checks that private companies have to do. I've been telling gun control people, you know, when I'm in a green room or whatever for a TV show, look, all you have to do is fix this. If there's a couple easy fixes, and I'll tell you the other one in a minute, you can get these universal background check laws passed. But they will refuse to go and, and have the federal government meet the same standard. I don't know if any of you have run a business or know somebody who has. If you were to go to them and they do background checks on employees and you'd say, you know, I think you ought to use roughly phonetically similar and similar birthdays to go and do background checks, <laughs> they will think like you're from Mars, okay? Because they say, why would I? And there could be tons of mistakes. And they know that. Look, if, the, if private companies had an error rate in doing background checks that's 100, the error rate that the federal government has, under federal law, they'd be sued out of existence. Why not apply the same standards to the government that the government requires that private companies have to go and meet here? Now, there are other problems that are here, too. Uh, well, I'll, just, I'll give you a, a, a war story for a minute. So I've had, as was mentioned, I was working in the Department of Justice uh, up until January 2021. Uh, so when I went to Washington, uh, I, was, uh, I was senior advisor for research and statistics in the Department of Justice, first the Office of Justice Programs and then the Office of Legal Policy. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to do is I, wanted, I knew from talking to other people who have run these programs that there was this huge discrimination problem. But I wanted to get the data. I wanted to get the raw data. It's easy data because the background checks ask people for both their sex and their race. And so you can see who gets denied. You could go and look at the false positives. It's easy to put that together. So I went in there, talked to the people at the Bureau of Justice Statistics. They were interested in it. They reached out to the FBI. And the FBI said that they weren't interested in looking at it. And the people at the Bureau of Justice says, well, you know, it's not really your call. Uh, you're, you collect this data, and we decide what we want to look at here. And so we'd like you to give us this data. And then the FBI came back and said, look, there's no reason why anybody would want to go and break down this data by race and sex. And my response is, you guys break down everything by race and sex. <laughs> What's the big deal about this particular thing here? And so anyway, we argue back and forth for a few weeks. And you have to understand, this is during COVID. 
So like on my floor, there was like maybe 300 desks. I had a little office on the side. And uh, on most days, I was the only person on my floor and the only person on, you know, three floors there because everybody worked at home. And the thing is, uh, it's not like you could go and knock on somebody's door and make them respond to you. You know, you send them emails, you leave them voice messages, and it just goes off into the ether someplace. So anyway, um, about a month goes by uh, without any responses from the data people at the FBI. And uh, uh, two days after the November election, uh, they get back to us and they say, okay, you guys are going to have to fill out a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request. Now, I don't know if you guys know how this stuff works, but that's something reporters put in. This is not what one part of the Department of Justice has to ask another part of the Department of Justice in order to go and get data. Uh, and, and, you know, particularly it's like the Bureau of Justice says it's, who's, it's its job to go and get data from the FBI. So anyway, um, uh, and, but they, to make it even worse, the FBI people say, but even if you fill out the FOIA request and get it in today, we're sure that the Biden administration will not be interested in this data. So there's no reason, and we can't, we're not going to be able to get it done until after January 20th. So there's no reason for you guys to even ask for it. So anyway, we argue back and forth again. They disappear again. And then the Thursday before Thanksgiving, uh, I get a call from Grover Norquist. You guys may not know who he is, but he's kind of a big muckety-muck in D.C., conservative muckety-muck. And uh, Grover and I have written a book together, so I know Grover pretty well. And uh, anyway, Grover uh, is calling me up because he's going to go and have a meeting uh, the next day with Mark, uh, uh, Mark Meadows, uh, the chief of staff in the White House there. And uh, Mark wants to know what things they can still accomplish before the end of the Trump administration. So I give, I give Grover two ideas. One of them is the one I'm talking about here. And uh, he goes in, meets with Mark, and Mark promises them that he'll call up Bill, on, Bill Barr on Monday morning and uh, tell him there are three things that the White House wants them to do before the end of the administration. Two of them are my ideas. So it's my understanding that uh, Mark called up Bill uh, late on Monday morning and, uh, and that, that Bill then sent a note over to the guys at the FBI that told him stop goofing around, work with Lot on this data. At three o'clock that afternoon, Politico comes out with a story at the top of their website. I don't know if you guys know what Politico is, but it's kind of the, a lot of former political reporters at the Washington Post who kind of set up their own news organization. And uh, they, um, they kind of get a lot of the political stories in D.C. Uh, in the administrations. And uh, anyway, at the top of their website was this headline, big headline, extra big headline, said, controversial pro-gun researcher joins Department of Justice. So apparently what happened was, as soon as Bill sent over uh, the note to the guys at the FBI to start working with me, they apparently must have immediately called up people in the media to complain about having to work with me. Poor people. So anyway, um, you know, it just shows you kind of how political things are around there. And so anyway, all heck broke loose. Uh, I don't know how many uh, emails and phone calls the Department of Justice got, but I was told they got more people demanding that I get fired uh, within like 24 hours than anybody else during the Trump administration. So that's <laughs> quite an accomplishment, I guess. And uh, the, um, uh, I, I don't know how many, I know I had an op-ed in the New York Times in 2018, um, and the op-ed editor there told me, who almost got fired over that too, uh, told me that uh, they got 75,000 angry emails within 24 hours of that piece. In fact, if you want to go back, my piece was published like on a Tuesday, uh, and on Thursday, the op-ed editor had an open letter to the New York Times family explaining why they published pieces that may be a little bit different than the normal kind of storyline that the New York... He, he, you know how he got fired over Tom Cotton's piece? 
Well, he almost got fired over mine, and that's the reason why he had to send out the letter. Anyway, I don't know how many they got, but it was a lot. So, uh, and then the following Monday, uh, all nine Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee sent a letter to Bill Barr demanding to know how somebody like me could get hired at the Department of Justice. Anyway, so, and I, we got tons of FOIA requests from all sorts of gun groups demanding that I give them emails back to 2015 and stuff. So basically, I'm buried with paperwork for two weeks. And then finally, the FBI starts working with us on the data. They give us the data, and the BJS people are looking at it, and there's like errors. The numbers just don't make any sense. So they call up the FBI people and say, oh, we're really glad you called us. We're just going to get in touch with you. We realize that we made mistakes. This is just summing up columns. It's kind of like putting a little sum statement at the bottom of the Excel column there. It, you kind of figure, how could you mess this up, guys? So anyway, they promise that they'll get to it. It takes like 15 minutes for them to put this data together. A week later, they come back with the data again. Again, there's obvious errors in it. We call them up again, they apologize, say they don't know how that happened, they'll fix it, they'll get back to us. That happened four times. The last conversation was on January 19th, uh, 2020, where they apologized profusely, promised that they would fix it and send it out, and of course, it died when the Biden people got in there. They weren't interested in trying to find out the error rate by race and gender. So anyway, that's kind of my war story. So uh, every time I go to Washington, it kind of confirms my worst fears about the government. And there's one other point I'll make, and this is just take a minute, on these background checks, and that is the costs that are there. So if you live in Washington, D.C., uh, it costs $125 to do a background check on a private transfer of a gun. In New York City, it's $125 to $225. Just to give you an idea how these things work in almost all these states, and that is, let's say, uh, Tim and I were uh, living in D.C. or California or Colorado or whatever. I didn't look up the rules here in Illinois. <clears throat> and I'm going to give them four guns. It's just one person giving one other person four guns. You would think it's just one background check. So there's only one person we have to check to see whether or not you have a criminal record or not. In fact, what they do is they require a separate background check on each gun. So rather than $125, it's $500. Now explain that to me other than just trying to make it costly for people to be able to go and transfer guns to somebody else. There's like no other logical explanation for why that should be happening. But here's the deal. If you believe that these background checks reduce crime, presumably you want to encourage people to go and do it. How is making them have to pay these fees essentially a tax on doing these transfers encouraging people to go and do it? Right? How's that doing that? And as an economist, I would say if you really do believe that these background checks reduce crime, and I confess I'm pretty skeptical, I don't think they do, but let's say you believe it. Uh, you believe it lowers crime for everybody, not just the law-abiding person who's going out of their way to go and obey the law, right? Well, as an economist, I would say whoever benefits should pay for it. If everybody benefits, then everybody should pay for it. Why make the entire burden of the background check be borne by the law abiding person who's going out of their way to have the check done? Okay? So for both of those reasons, I say, look, if you really believe that these are benefits, pay for it out of general revenue. And so the two things that I've told gun control people, if you go and you pay for this out of general revenue, and if you make it get rid of these false positives, you'll be able to get these background check laws passed right away. But they, the media never mentions these problems. You know, when they talk about universal background checks, you will search in vain to see any discussions about these two types of issues. You know, then it's just, you know, purely do you want to reduce crime or not? And, uh, and my, you know, so they often say gun control advocates, we just want reasonable gun control laws. I just want reasonable fixes to the gun control laws that they have. Give me an explanation how you can have a system where you have 3.8 million mistakes, basically, and it's poor minorities who, through no fault of their own, are being discriminated against and having these errors. You can go get it fixed. Most people are going to have to have a, hire a lawyer to go and get the error, errors fixed. But you're talking about 
literally like $3,000 on up to go and do that. And so who are you stopping? Who are you stopping? Through no fault of their own, you're making it so poor minorities are being stopped from being able to go and buy guns to protect themselves and their families. And, and I think it's a conscious effort, all these things. You know, just one last point, and that is, you know, when I was showing you before, like Texas, when they reduced the fees, who voted for reducing the fees? It was unanimous vote among Republicans. It was like one Democrat in the Senate and the House that voted also in favor of reducing the fees. Why is it that the Democrats vote uniformly against reducing any fees there? If you want to let poor people be able to go and defend themselves, there's a big difference between $140 and $40. Anyway, <clears throat> appreciate your time. Uh, I'm happy to, I'd probably talk too long. <laughs> You didn't talk too long. I thought that was that was fascinating. I don't have a lot to say. This is not my field. Uh, I have a couple of quick uh, comments, mostly about uh, John. Um, so I was a student here in 1995 through 1998, and I was in the law and economics workshop. And so I saw John, who was an Olin fellow at the time, present uh, the paper and research he's most famous for, which is more guns, less crime. I saw him present that for the first time, the data for that twice at the Gary Becker Applied Theory Workshop and here at the Law and Economics Workshop. And as you can imagine, his views are a little heterodox. Uh, the title, More Gums, Less Crime, uh, is provocative. Uh, and the hatred that he described from the FBI and the New York Times readership, et cetera, uh, maybe it preceded that, but from my consciousness really started at that point. And um, I don't think I truly appreciated what it was like to be pilloried as an academic at that time as a student. Um, I think I have a better appreciation for that now uh, as someone who has some heterodox views. Uh, and I would just say, you know, personally, it was quite hard, this isn't about me, but it was quite hard for me to be in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the, my favorite was the Wall Street Journal article that started out, Everyone Hates Todd Henderson. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was, hard, it was hard to go home to my wife. Um, and, you know, I've got a, it's been personally quite hard on me. And the reason I'm saying that to you is because I think I've experienced a lot less of this than John has. And so what he's doing in presenting this data um, takes a huge amount of courage. And persevering in the face of that hatred, 75,000 emails, et cetera, takes a lot of courage. This is a Navy SEAL courage kind of thing, uh, but, but it does take a lot of courage. And so I, I thank him for, for persevering on that. Uh, second thing is, just uh, personally, as a, to tell you what guns are like in the academy, when I started here, I was at one of our faculty lunches where it's just sort of an intellectual topic. And someone said, why would anyone ever need to own a gun? Or something to that effect. Uh, maybe Heller was being you know, in the lower courts or something. Um, and you know, like an idiot, I'm, I'm a new person. I thought, you know, you're supposed to share your views pretty openly. And like, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm rational, so I, I rely generally on the Chicago Police Department to protect my family and my unborn child. And at that moment, the, the, you get to see the it was going off the rails already. Um, I said, but you know, there could be a time when the Chicago Police Department doesn't, right? They can't, they can't get there fast enough, they don't get there, um, or maybe, there's a time when they actually come after me. You know, I mean, think Crystal Knocked or you know, fill in your, you know, LA riots, whatever. Fill in your scenario. And um, you know, my primary job is to protect my family. So why wouldn't I engage in a kind of cost-benefit analysis where I'm like, well, what's the probability that they're going to be able to do this job versus the probability that I would be able to do it versus the accident rate if I had a gun in the house and would I be able to do it? And you know, if I were using it would the, in a situation, would the police think I was a criminal? I mean, you're doing all this kind of calculation and I might naturally come out on the side of wanting to own a weapon. 
And I, I think it's pretty lucky that they didn't uh, run me out of town on a rail just at that point because every, all you know, 12 faces looked at me like I had two heads. So this is a dangerous topic. And honestly, as I sit here and listen to John talk, I, I don't understand why. Because the data he's presenting is not about people like me. I mean, I have huge privileges in the fact that the police will come quickly to my house if my alarm goes off. If I'm standing there with a weapon, they're not going to think that I'm a bad guy. Like, I just, all these things cut in favor of me. And all the stuff he's talking about has no effect on me. I can afford $400. When I applied for my, uh, my gun ownership thing in Illinois, um, you know, I got it. There were no, no mistakes were made. Um, uh, I guarantee I'm the only person on the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's talking about protecting the most vulnerable people. Now, I, you know, if there are arguments about why the poorest parts of Chicago should put more faith in the Chicago Police Department, I would love to hear them. I've had my run-ins with the Chicago Police Department. I don't have a lot of faith in the Chicago Police Department, and I guarantee you if my skin were five or six shades darker, I'd have close to zero. So that means self-help, and the things he's talking about here are, are in that direction. So I'm done. I want to hear people's questions, but I want to thank Dr. Locke for coming uh, and really for his courage in, in persevering on these subjects. So join me in thanking him. Yeah, thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Lott, if you want to send her a 10 minute question. Yeah, of course. Now, there's into QA. So, um, yeah, raise those hands. I've got a question. Um, so, we call on it. Dusty. Um, if somebody is going to read the thesis, who should we put the blame on? Who should we blame these screws that are going on? The FBI will give you the data. Local police forces are more capable of making these checks. Should we say, hey, it's on you? Stop. We know what the negative effects are of these. Should we be mad at the police department? Should we be mad at the FBI for enforcing these? Or would you uh, say, okay, you're the policy makers? It seems to me that both parties are responsible. We should be pissed at the FBI. We should be pissed at all our local police departments for enforcing these laws. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I blame uh, police departments for enforcing the laws. But I think it's the politicians who pass the laws. And I think the problem I have with the FBI is I think the FBI, and I can give you lots of stories, is really incredibly political. Uh, and, uh, and so they don't want to give out data that kind of goes against what their political views are on things or what they think is, you know, helps the people that they want to help out. But, you know, so that's bad. Um, you know, because I, I think we want to have sunlight on these types of things to see how bad these things are. And the fact that they fight so hard just makes me believe that they, it's not good. So, uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's a policymaker decision there. Um, yeah, dinosaur sugar. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you argue that gun control in the U.S. is like functionally biased against people of color, and that both the National Urban League and the NAACP have caused a strip of gun control laws and are standing ground. What do you understand what they understand? Well, I mean, look, uh, most people who listen to the media, okay, constantly hear about bad things that happen. Most never hear about any benefits. So two years ago, we looked at news coverage uh, on defensive gun uses in the United States. If you just take the top five newspapers, for example, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, and the Wall Street Journal, between those five publications, they had a total of 10 defensive gun use stories. Almost all of them had something go wrong. The wrong person shot, the gun taken away from the person, something went wrong. By contrast, they had 1, 000, over 1,700 news stories about people being killed or wounded in gun crime type situation. They had over 2,700 news stories about gun crimes total. If you add in CNN and MSNBC, they had zero defensive gun uses on those uh, programs. And so you could be somebody who thinks you're well educated. You know, you read the major news outlets, you watch TV news all the time. And you may never hear of even one defensive gun use, and the one or two you hear about, something goes wrong. 
And yet you hear tons of crime. So why not just go and say, well, if I just get rid of guns, then the crime won't be there. It won't be happening. Uh, if you look that year, uh, there were like 2,000, a little bit over 2,000 across the whole media, about 2,000 defensive gun use stories that got some type of coverage. But just to give you an idea, the majority of those cases involved instances where the attacker was killed. 42% of them involved instances where the attacker was wounded. Just 4% of them involved brandishing of guns in order to stop an attack. And most of those involved cases where the attacker was held at gunpoint until the police arrived. <clears throat> the best data that I've seen indicates that in fact about 95% of defensive gun uses involve brandishing. Why the big disconnect between what the media covers and whatever? Imagine you're editor of a news bureau and you have two stories that come across your desk. In one case, there's a dead body on the ground. In another case, a woman's brandished a gun. The would-be attackers run away. No shots are fired. No dead body on the ground. You're not even sure what crime would have been committed. If you're editor of the news bureau, which one would you put on the front page? I think I know what I would do. I'd put the dead body on the ground on the front page versus the case where I don't even know what crime would have been committed. So I'm not saying that necessarily all this involves bias on the part of the media. It bleeds, it leads, okay, uh, type of thing. They want to get clicks. They want to get people interested in the stories. But the point is, all that, you know, what may be newsworthy doesn't necessarily reflect reality. But it has an impact on people's perceptions. If you constantly only hear about bad things with, that happen with guns, and you don't hear about the benefits, People are going to be much more in favor of gun control or getting rid of guns than they would have otherwise. I'll give you a couple other facts. <clears throat> because there are a lot of people that just say, well, you should just count up the number of news stories on defensive gun uses as opposed to doing other ways that we get the information. Less than 20, about 22% of violent crimes are reported to police. Okay? <clears throat> so those have like no chance of getting news stories on them. Uh, even the 22% of violent crimes that report to police, what percent do you think get covered by the news media? Just a tiny fraction of those types of cases. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of other issues that are here, such as what I was just talking about. Even the ones that they do cover are skewed towards cases which, so most people think, well, if I use a gun defensively, the most likely outcome is somebody's going to get killed. Well, that probably gives people caution whether they want to go and get involved with that as compared to simple brandishing. So, um, you know, for people who live in urban areas, given how biased the media coverage is on it, it's just not that. Um, you know, I could talk for hours about the data from the federal government. I have to tell you, I have a hard time believing a lot of the data that comes out from the, uh, from the government on crime stuff. Um, can, give I offer one, can I offer one other potential sure. uh, response, which is totally different? which is um, issue, political issues are bundled together and certain issues are used as both getting, you know, we're the good guys issues. Republicans do this too with fear of crime and, you know, all these things. I mean, as John described, you know, most counties there's no murders and yet there's lots of people in rural North Carolina who are running to the polls to, to vote about, about murders. Um, and so one of the things that I think we see is we see Democrats use guns and violence of uh, gun control as a mechanism to get people to go to the polls. So if you're the if you're the if you're the NAACP and what you're really interested in is getting wealth transfers and opportunities and things for your constituents, you might just and you're more likely to get those from Democrats. Then you might say, well, we'll support these gun issues because that's a thing that mobilizes people to go to the polls and vote, and we'll get people, Democrats in power, and then they're going to vote, is, you know, economic issues are the things we care about. So I think it's really hard in a situation where all these political issues are bundled together to unpack and say, if you were just voting on this issue and it didn't affect who got elected or whatever, what the optimal policies would be. And frankly, I don't know. Uh, we should go ask people in Garfield Park uh, what they think about the rules and whether they should be able to protect themselves. We should hear from those people. I don't really rely on the people who are the political wranglers to what their opinions are. Just one quick thing, because I think Todd brings up an interesting point. You have the same issue with like school choice. 
I, I don't. I, I look at it. I have no. I can't understand why blacks vote overwhelmingly for people who oppose school choice. I mean, they are the ones who would benefit overwhelmingly by having competition and being able to go and choose between different schools rather than getting stuck in there. And one other point on the, you know, um, I, my guess is most of you don't know this, but over 92% of violent crime has nothing to do with guns. But you look at surveys, 58% uh, of Democrats, or the average Democrat thinks 58% of violent crime involves guns. The average Republican is like 38%. Anyway, so I don't know. Okay, so uh, I think we are unfortunately out. Yeah, I apologize for talking so long. But, but it's just um, 